Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. Mark 9. We read responsively one of the companion passages to this in Luke. And my plan is next Sunday to read another companion passage, which is uh, in Matthew. But I want us to see this today, and I hope you don't mind me having you up and down. Uh, but I would like, like for us to stand when, we, when I read the scripture that is before us. So if you'd stand with me and if you don't have a Bible, we have the text on the screen and would be glad to give you a Bible if you would see me after the service. Follow along as I read this wonderful passage. Mark 9, verses 14 to 29, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, that, that is, saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the Spirit saw him, that is Jesus, Immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it's often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can... All things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Some things we need to learn about this. Ditches to avoid to be sure. There are those who make an excess of faith. But the answer to that is not to ignore the principle of faith. May God help us to travel the evangelical path as we learn the lesson Jesus taught on the importance of faith. Thank you. Please be seated. It's, a, it's an interesting situation we find ourselves here. We can say that both literally and figuratively it's true that Jesus and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, had just come down from a mountaintop experience. Remember? They were... On the mount, we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Some have suggested it was Mount Moriah. 
in the promised land. There, Jesus takes his three to the inner circle. They travel to a mountain, and before they know it, Moses and Elijah are there. The, the one who stands for the law, Moses, the one who is, is the typical prophet, Elijah. Jesus is transformed so that there's a glowing countenance about him. I told you when we looked at that passage, it is reminiscent of how the tabernacle in the wilderness would, would shine with what was called the Shekinah glory of God, this beaming, imminent light that Moses experienced a measure of that when he went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments and came back down with a glow about him. Well, Jesus is transformed briefly to draw back the veil. The disciples, Peter, James, and John, can see a glimpse of heaven where the law and the prophets are subservient to him. They listen and learn from him. The idea was that they would head down from that mountain and be absolutely convinced that Jesus is greater than any person, any truth, any reality that they had grown up being taught in Judaism. In fact, the whole book of Hebrews is committed to this theme. Jesus is greater than. He is superior to. And so that, that's a, a brief encounter on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're coming down from that. And they come down to find nine disciples, one father with a demon-possessed son, a group of scribes. The scribes are arguing with the disciples. There's a crowd that's gathered. We learn as we dig into this a little bit, and we're going to dig more next week, but we learn that that apparently the scribes were chiding the disciples. The man had come to find Jesus and ask Jesus to deliver his son from this, this demon possession that, that manifested itself by, by causing his son not to be able to speak. It's called a mute spirit. Apparently a, a, deaf, a deafness and a muteness attended it. He would... He would suddenly throw the boy down. We, uh, we've seen things like this, not, not necessarily demon possession in, a, in an epileptic, grand mal epilepsy, convulsing. But this was a demon possession. He brought his boy hoping to find Jesus. He doesn't find Jesus. He finds the nine. Now remember, the nine who when they were a full complement of 12, had been sent out two by two. And they came back with the report, Jesus, it was amazing. Even the demons were subject to us. Jesus' response was very interesting. Then if you remember, he said, he didn't say good for you or I'm glad that, that my power attended you. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. That was his response. And then he says, rejoice not that the demons were subject to you. So he, he believed them. He knew it. He, he, had, he had indeed sent an attending power with them when they went. Rejoice not that the demons were subject to you, but rejoice that your names have been written down in heaven. And you get the impression here that these nine offer to act in Jesus' place and they, they depend upon the past experience they had rather than depending upon the power of God. And they try to cast the demon out of this boy. In fact, at the end of the passage you read, they, they get along with Jesus and say, why couldn't we cast it out? They're flabbergasted. They're, they're, they're mortified. They try to cast out the demon and they're not successful in doing so. And I think when you piece the whole story together, Matthew's 
portion of it, Luke's portion of it, Mark's portion of it, what you discover is that the scribes seize the opportunity to mock them for their powerlessness. And an argument breaks out. And you can imagine, if you use a little sanctified imagination, that some of the disciples saying, well, look, we've, we've, we've done this before. We went out two by two, and, and, and the demons were subject to us when we went out. You can almost get that going on there. And the scribes are mocking them and questioning them, trying to, trying to humiliate them in front of the crowd. Because remember, the crowds still gather at this point in the Gospels, still gather when Jesus is in the area. So that's the scene. A frustrated father, frustrated disciples, joyful scribes, they've caught the followers of Jesus in a situation where they look weak, where they look like frauds. And Jesus and Peter, James, and John should have been coming off the mountain back to a glorious return. Reflecting upon it, Jesus said, don't tell anyone what you've seen until after the resurrection. Just gloriously reflecting upon the encounter on the mountain. Now some of the commentators suggest that Jesus was actually still it had something of the beaming glow about him. Because listen to the text here. Verse 15. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. What, what would have triggered a great amazement? You could, you could understand that the text said, were greatly satisfied, were were thrilled to finally see him. That's not what we're told here. Their excitement is not at finally see him. There is, their excitement, their amazement is at seeing him. So it could well be that when he comes off this mountain that there's still something of the, of the transformation residue about him. And that's not hard to believe because, as I said earlier, Moses came off the mountain from having encountered God and received the Ten Commandments, and he himself was glowing so much so that the people said to Moses, Moses, put a veil over your face. We can't handle, we, we cannot, we can't handle looking at you, that, that the brightness of your countenance. I would say parenthetically that a Christian who is full of joy and hope and believing uh, has the same effect on, uh, on the world we live in today. They, they don't. Folks, if you haven't picked this up, people don't like Christians who are full of joy and full of hope. They much prefer Christians who are down in the mouth, shuffling around, grumbling, complaining, accusing, always angry at what's happening in the culture, they, they much prefer that because, because they identify more with that. That's the way people are. But a Christian full of joy, full of hope, what's called the, uh, the, that being full of that in, in believing, that is in faith, faith that fuels joy in our lives, faith that fuels hope, the world still wants us to cover that up. And they might as well say, put, some, put a sack over it. I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. And yet I think that the darker it gets in our culture, the greater opportunity we have to shine as diamonds of God's grace. Trophies of his treasure house. And so they're amazed Jesus asks them in this early part of the encounter, what are you arguing about with them? And we don't get that answer because, because by this time the father, someone in the crowd, the father approaches Jesus and says, teacher, I, I brought my son to you. There's, there's almost in that a sense of uh, 
disappointed in dignity. I brought him to you. I was looking for you. Implied in that is, and you weren't here. My son has this spirit that ebbs and flows in its intensity and how it manifests itself in him. The most common evidence being it makes him mute. He just doesn't talk. My son won't talk. And there are times when he convulses. And so you see that basically in the man explaining what's going on with his son is implicitly accusing Jesus for not being there. And this whole encounter sets up for Jesus the opportunity to teach a lesson on faith. The man will later cry out when Jesus rebukes him, really is what he does. I believe, but help my unbelief. And I, and I think there's a lot in that to where we live. And I believe Jesus, while he will meet us there, would have us go beyond that. That growing and maturing as a follower of Jesus Christ would bring us to the point where we say, Lord, I believe. He's going to teach us something in this passage when we look at it more next week. That such faith, in the face of such faith, he says nothing is impossible. Now, I said we're going to drill down more next week in this, but I want to just say to you, there's two ditches to avoid here. To him who believes in Jesus for who he is, And who he has declared himself to be, which is to believe in Jesus and in the the Father of Jesus, to believe in God for who he is and who he says to be, his attributes as described in Scripture, to believe wholeheartedly with our minds, not doubting, ask in faith, not doubting, we're taught. To believe that those things which God purposes to accomplish will come to pass in our lives and in our, in our circumstances and in a way that we are aware that God is moving. See, I think this is part of the problem we deal with today. Because faith is often subjugated, it's often put back to, well, I believe, I, there was a time in my life where I, where I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So I believe that Jesus is my Savior. It's, it's almost what we would call historic or, or, or faith in the past, past faith. I've even encountered some people who would tell you, well, I've always believed. Him. And I'm, I want to be kind here today, but that's, that is not true. <laughs> no one has always believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We come into this world patently non-believers, unbelievers. So whether a person is thinking, well, I've always believed, or a person is thinking, well, I, 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 that whole belief thing, I settled that with Jesus some time ago, months ago, years ago, decades ago. That's not what Jesus is teaching about here. Saving faith is included because, as, as the Hebrew says, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So, so there has to be that initial encounter of saving faith. But it's, but it's saving faith puts us on the path of growing in faith. Faith is not a one-time event like I stepped over the line. Now I believe on the other side of the line I didn't believe. But now I'm over the line I do believe. Faith is a journey. I do believe. I grow in, in every day. I have opportunities to walk through difficult providence, sometimes dark providence, and sometimes where I can only put one foot in front of another, but I'm walking by faith through the providences. And I'm growing in my love of the Lord. I'm growing in my confidence in Jesus. You've probably faced times in your life where you've stood 
and ask yourself, how, how, Lord, will I get through this? And yet what I just described to you is a historical moment in your life, and you're here today as evidence that you did get through it. Jesus would have us grow in grace and in a knowledge of him as our Lord and Savior, and that growing in grace includes growing in faith. In other words, if we've known the Lord Jesus Christ for years, decades, then ours should not be a childlike faith. We've talked about this before. You would know something is terribly wrong with a child who's in his 30s or 40s or 50s in diapers, unable to communicate. That is not normative. Karen and I were watching recently a movie entitled The Dropbox. It's a, it's a tremendous if you've not seen it yet, I would encourage you to watch it. Story about a pastor in South Korea who, who set up a box for babies who were abandoned. They're abandoned by the hundreds in Seoul, South Korea every year. And he sets up a box where, where these babies can be taken and placed in this box to keep them out of the elements as they're abandoned by their moms. For various reasons, some, some because they have severe handicaps, some because the mom is a teenager and can't take care of the child, various reasons. And the, a, an alarm goes off in his house to let him know that someone has opened the drop box and a baby's been placed in it. And he cares for a son, this, this pastor does, he cares for a son who is full-grown adult biologically or at least by his birthday age, but is a child. He's still in diapers. They have to feed him. And, that's tragic, but you look at that and you know that is tragedy. That's not normalcy. And so for someone who has known the Lord Jesus Christ for years, many years, multiple years, and to, to still be functioning on childlike faith, that is not normative. It is not the way we should grow in the Lord. And this is what Jesus is addressing here. This is why, why you're going to get that cry, oh, faithless generation. It's interesting. He is saying that. <laughs> Not primarily to the crowd, though it applies to the crowd. He's not even saying it primarily to the scribes, though it applies to the scribes. He is saying it to the nine disciples who apparently asserted themselves into the conversation to say, we can take care of this, and they were not able. Let me close today, and we're going to come back next week. Here's... The point I want to drive home today. Faith, not mixed with prayer, is not faith by biblical definition. Whether it's an individual, you're wondering, well, Pastor, I don't, I don't see the Lord moving in my life. Well, are you, are, you, are you mistaking faith with presumption? You simply presume God will do this, that, and the other because he saved you? God used means to save you. He will use means to sanctify you. He will use means to hear you and answer you. And the primary means Jesus mentions here is faith with prayer. Prayer and faith separated produces a discouraging Christian life. That's, whether that's in an individual, a home, or a church congregation. We say, we want to see the Lord bless us. We want to see the Lord increase us. We want to see the Lord add to our number those who are coming from non-church backgrounds, who have, who have no experience with the gospel, and the Lord saves them, and we get to nurture them and grow them. But is that just talk? Or would the Lord be able to look upon the life of Bethel Baptist Church and say, there is evidence right there that congregationally they mean what they say they want to see me do? And I would submit to you that's faith and prayer mixed. 
I've said to every congregation I've ever pastored that the Lord historically and currently does business with those who mean business with him. I've told you this story before, I'm going to close today just to remind you. W.A. Criswell was at one time pastor of the largest Southern Baptist congregation and one of the largest evangelical congregations in the world, First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. He was a dear man, a godly man, no doubt about it. He traveled with James Harris, who was my pastor when I was in seminary. Dr. Harris was the one who told me the story. He traveled to Korea when the, when the great spiritual awakening that came by prayer was happening in South Korea. And they went and gathered with the, some of the cell groups there and the leaders of those. They were introducing one another. Dr. Crystal was introduced and he, they asked him to say a few things about his ministry. He said, I'm Dr. W.A. Criswell. I pastor the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, where we have, uh, I forget how many thousands of members they had. And he said, we have, we have 6,000 of those members who come on Sunday morning for worship services. We have 3,000 who come back on Sunday night. And we have uh, 1,000 who gather on Wednesday night to pray. So they went around the room and introduced the other guests from America. And they got ready to have a prayer time, which was the heart and soul of the Korean church, South Korean church, in the multiplied hundreds of thousands of people who came to Christ. And a little lady at the meeting, Dr. James Harris told me, a little lady spoke up and said, I think when we pray tonight, we need to pray for Pastor Criswell's church where only 10% of the people value prayer meeting. In the Korean mindset, and by the way, in the mindset of Christians around the world, it is inconceivable that a church would believe it would see the blessing of God unless the church understood the mixture of faith and prayer. I've told that story everywhere I've ever pastored. For whatever reason, I've yet to have a people who take me up on it. Jesus would teach us a lesson here if we were willing to learn the lesson and apply the lesson and act upon the lesson. We'll see it fleshed out a little more next week, God willing, when we gather back. The important lesson on prayer, it's the importance of faith and prayer mixed, not doubting. Let's pray.